You mentioned that people could study both insight and meta meditation. Do you advise focusing on one at a time? If so, for how long? A week, a month, a year, or longer? <laughs> Forever and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about this practice is that it all actually comes together. So whether your vehicle is so-called insight practice, or whether you prioritize metta meditation or breath meditation, probably other kinds of meditation that I don't even know about, um, you're going to develop insight, you're going to develop calm. So Ajahn Chah always said that the practice is called bhavana, it's not called samatha vipassana, which means calm and insight. These are, again, kind of artificial divisions. Some practices do have a tendency to develop more calm. Others are more directed to the arising of insight. But insight isn't a practice in itself. Insight is what arises as the result of a practice. And it can arise as the result of metta or anapana or so-called insight practice. So it all goes together, and it's all part of the Eightfold Path. We have to have some right view to understand what we're doing and why, and how to apply the practices that we're doing in skillful ways. Also, a part of right view is being able to differentiate between the wholesome and the unwholesome states of mind. Um, so it naturally involves some discernment. I mean, in meta meditation too, you're using a lot of discernment around you know, how exactly you direct that metta how you say the phrases, to whom, for how long. And the real insight that you're getting, the main insight, I would say, and it can be many insights, but the main insight you're getting pre-jhana is how to work with and overcome the hindrances, basically how to understand your mind and how to develop those wholesome states and undermine the less wholesome ones that lead to suffering. So... Bit by bit, you're kind of clearing the veils of the mind so you can see more deeply, more clearly. And so in that sense, as long as you're undermining those hindrances, it is leaning, leading to insight. So focusing on one at a time. <laughs> um, again, if that relates to methods, then probably yes. But the fact that calm and insight can arise through any method, then you don't need to focus on one at a time. Um, in my first sort of meditation uh, practice, we did used to kind of split the 10 days into three days of breath meditation and then seven days of so-called insight meditation, which was looking at the characteristic of impermanence mainly and developing equanimity with that. But really, I once asked my teacher in Burma, who was teaching basically the same method, it came to me after years and years, maybe more than 10 years of practice, that perhaps I was still only at the level of, ins uh, at the level of samatha, actually. Because if I'm not a stream winner yet, then is it really insight practice? Mm. And he said something really interesting. He said, as long as you have the feeling or the view that someone in here is watching whatever's arising and passing, then it's still samatha. It's still only calming the mind. You haven't actually seen through the fact that even the one observing is also arising and passing every moment. The consciousness is arising and passing at the speed of consciousness, I guess, but faster than we can see. Very fast. Very, very fast. Even the sensations you could start to experience, like many in a second, like maybe arising and passing 20 or 30 times. I mean, you couldn't really count it, right? But you just feel the oscillation is so fast and the mind is even faster. It has to be that fast to keep up with it anyway, but it's actually even faster than that. So these two things grow together. They grow hand in hand. But at term, times in our practice, we can emphasize one over the other. And I think personally for me, I choose that based on what I feel my weakness is in practice or sometimes based on the current state of my mind, like depending on the hindrances that are there. So if there's a lot of restlessness, I find body scanning or something a little bit more active really helps. If there's a kind of um, getting stuck with something or... Um, 
especially more afflictive emotions, then I do find that watching the impermanence of them really helps. So that can be sort of an insight practice. Um, if I find there's irritation, then maybe I try metta because it's the opposite of ill will. Um, I usually ground myself in the body first, as we have been doing here, and have some appreciation of impermanence, but generally that's not a very good perception for going deeper in samatha, because with samatha you're trying to get some steadiness, and as the mind kind of simplifies, you start to see the diversity settle and become more and more unified, so your experience becomes simpler in a way and even the feelings of metta in this case would become kind of more consistent and less nuanced in a sense I mean not any less profound but more steady and stable so it's not advisable at that time to start looking for the impermanence yeah because you need a sort of steady place that you can gradually relinquish control relinquish um yeah, too much striving and control and just start to merge with the object. So, if so, for how long? It basically, the practice is for life. But I do think it's advisable to practice some metta every day, at the very least when you wake up before you go to bed. And uh, try different retreats, you know. This is probably a question from someone who maybe hasn't got a lot of experience in either. I might be wrong. But I would say it's good to try different retreats and see... If there's something that really uh, works for you and that could last for 10 years and then you might choose to specialise in something else for a while. I love 10 years, I don't know. But in the end you find that all these seemingly different ways in kind of merge and through insight practices too you can come to very deep states of samadhi. It's possible when the mind's ready. I hope that makes sense. I keep bouncing around with the phrases I use during meta meditation. Do you actually like bounce on the floor? That'd be really cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> I know what you mean. I'm just being silly. For instance, for myself, I use may I be patient. Hmm. But this seems off the mark when working with a person for whom I feel great love because this person already manifests great patience. Perhaps I need to be more general so that it applies to everyone, e.g. may I be safe. I excel at overcomplicating things, but nonetheless, this is my question. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be analytical. But actually, I think you're right there. I think um, the fact that this can't really apply to everyone probably suggests that it's a little bit too specific a wish, even for yourself. I mean, it's a lovely wish, but it's not an unconditional wish in the sense that you're actually asking yourself to be something different, if that makes sense. It's actually asking that you have a certain quality, which is different from a general benevolent wish of may you be well and happy. Happy is more of a state of mind, more than a quality. I don't know if it... Is it easy to distinguish that? Can you see the difference there? Yeah. Because otherwise we can have so many kind of wishes for ourselves that are actually kind of a little bit like slight fault finding. You know, I'm not enough this way, so I want to be more of that. So, I mean, if, if my every patient helps you, that's fine. I would say it's maybe something to more hold in the back of the mind and have a sort of general aspiration to notice when impatience comes up and then be gentle with that, try to become more present. I was saying to someone today in the group uh, discussions that um, patience is of two types. It can be waiting in the future, which for most people it usually is, including myself. You're being patient as long as it changes, right? You're being patient until you're waiting for something to happen. <laughs> or there's waiting in the moment which is the real patience. And it's not actually waiting for anything to change, it's just being with and going more deeply into what's already there. So this kind of perception can be really helpful, like being with the phrases, being with whatever's arising is another way to develop patience. But it's a great aspiration. It might be just, yeah, better to have more general phrases, but experiment and find out for yourself. Yeah, 
I don't think there's really a wrong or a right here. But um, it's interesting to notice. <laughs> Maybe just try choosing some simple phrases and staying with them for a while and seeing what happens. I mean, I chose my phrases the first time I did an intensive, so-called intensive meta retreat. In other words, I just practiced meta for two weeks. And, um, and I found they ended up having a really strong association with that time, which is why I use them often because it has such a strong positive connotation for me now that it just elicits the feelings of loving kindness. So it's almost like they have a meaning, but it's gone beyond the meaning, to, almost straight to the direct experience. So it can be nice to just have some general phrases and stay with them for a while. Having said that, it might change when you go through the categories. It might change. This morning, a fellow yogi and I exchanged a brief inquiry on intestinal well-being. <laughs> mm-hmm. I lost track of time and rang the bell late. My fellow yogi said, that's why we must not break noble silence. Yeah, because otherwise there'd be no bell, right? <laughs> Sorry about the bad joke. <laughs> but you rang the bell late. <laughs> 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 I'm truly sorry if I contributed to anyone's suffering. Oh, you probably only contributed to yours by being too guilty. <laughs> and this, it's really not a big thing. May we all hold compassion for each other. Please comment about noble silence. Clearly you have a lot of compassion for everybody and I hope that you can have it for yourself because most probably you were speaking about intestinal well-being out of compassion for your gut health and the other person's gut health. (laughs) And yeah, it can be easy to lose track of time. So this is one reason why um, it's helpful to keep noble silence, of course. But um, yeah, I mean, you rang the bell eight, it's not a big deal. So, and I think whatever your fellow yogi said was a reminder to themselves, not to you, you know, it wasn't a reprimand. It's just, it's a a re-establishing of awareness, isn't it? which is always good. You know, whenever we lose track of anything, it's always an opportunity to become aware again. So we can kind of chalk that one up. Yes, I regained my mindfulness rather than, ah, I lost it. So um, very good that you regained it. And indeed, may we all, all hold compassion for each other. Wouldn't that be a wonderful, wonderful world? Please comment about noble silence. Sometimes it can be no bells. That's how my teacher does it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a corny joke, but that's uh, his joke too. Like, this is a no bell silence retreat. He has no bells um, because he wants you to really get into the, the feel of the practice and your own rhythm and listen to your body. And we haven't really done that here because it's always a matter of finding kind of flexibility around a structure that works for the center and for everyone who's running it as well. Um, But maybe in the last day we can have a bit of no bell silence. I don't know. Maybe some bell, but not too much bell. (laughs) Or you just zone out the bell. I don't know. (laughs) So don't worry if, you know, the bells don't quite happen on time. Um, Noble silence is beautiful because our minds chatter so much already. And you'll probably find that you're chattering about stuff that you don't even know where it came from. But it's certainly related to things you've spoken about before or other people have said or you've seen it on the news or you've seen it secondhand or thirdhand or fourthhand somewhere. And the mind just kind of wants to chat because it's a distraction for the mind. It's this Mara fella or lady, whichever gender it might be. Um, so... Instead of encouraging that, the noble silence um, is an opportunity to see the chattering of the mind and not to feed it. And you'll find that if you do chatter on retreat, then you'll probably just put more input in your mind and that will create another level of, uh, of thought that you have to wait for to subside. It does subside, but the longer we can be silent, the more it subsides. And um, I've been on long retreats and... In Myanmar, where I ordained, um, we basically just meditated like 18 hours a day or up to 18 hours. There was nothing else to do and it was wonderful. I'd prepared for this for 10 years, so 
I was ready for that. And my teacher was there with us meditating most of the day. And he had very strong metta, so it was just an inspiration, really, to uh, practice in that atmosphere and live such a simple life. And uh, even then, it took about four months, probably, until the chattering stopped, like really stopped. And I think partly that was to do with um, feeling I really had arrived and my life was going to be there. This is what I thought anyway, from there on in, that was it. No more moving around, no more searching for opportunities to ordain. I landed, I wasn't going anywhere, and it was just the golden era of my monastic life. It was just a feeling of totally being in the right place at the right time with nothing to do but to keep letting go and keep going deeper. And it was a privilege and a blessing. And the mind had nothing more to say. You know, it didn't have to think about what it's doing tomorrow or what it might do which, what, when the visa ends. Unfortunately, the visa did end and we had to leave the country after 13 months. But it was interesting to notice that the mind kind of had nothing more to chit-chat about. And sometimes I could even see, I'm sure other people too, on even shorter retreats have seen the kind of subverbal bubbling up of some concept that doesn't quite make it into a verbalised word in the mind. You just see the kind of root of it and you see how it's just a habit. It's just a habit, you know, and if you can catch it, it doesn't actually manifest as a thought. But it's interesting because I share this because there's another lady in Australia who's a laywoman but very devoted to the practice. And she basically lives on her own like nine months a year and she comes to the monastery I go to for meditation for community (laughs) because compared to her ordinary life, there's actually a lot of activity at the retreat centre. She lives in complete solitude. I'm not sure how she does it. I guess she must get deliveries, food deliveries. And she said the same thing. She said, it's about four months until I can go to the subverbal level of the mind, and it it actually stops. So we want to give ourselves the best chance of at least having a glimpse of the silent mind, because that's when we can really start to get deeper in in the samadhi practice. And those states of jhana, especially the fourth, I think it's the fourth jhana is known as, must be all of the jhanas, because there's absolutely no speech. Like when they say there's vitaka and vichara in the first jhana, it's the subverbal, slight, very subtle moving of the mind onto its object and staying with it. But it's not verbalization. But the fourth jhana is so still, and I don't, you know, my teacher can talk about this. (laughs) because this is beyond my experience yet but it's so deep and so still that there really is no movement of the mind and that's called the real noble silence so it's a very deep state and um, what we're doing here is just restraining our outer speech so um, I guess it's called noble because it leads to noble states of mind silence is lovely when we make friends with it Otherwise, it can be a little bit intimidating at first. Okay. I tried to choose a very mild person with conflict to send loving kindness. In fact, I'm not sure there is a conflict or just made up in my head. I started and became nauseous, headached. I stopped. I lose time when I meditate, so I don't know how long I did it. I switched to the person I love. It changed quality, but my nervous system stayed activated. I came out of meditation groggy and slightly off balance. I went back to my room and rested, slowly returning to baseline. Please comment. Thank you. Yeah, I guess this is an interesting experience and probably a fairly common one. Um, It's interesting, isn't it? Because it says that you weren't even sure there was a conflict, but I would imagine that even sensing that there might be already uses a lot of energy, right? Because conflict tires us, and whether it's conflict with another person or conflict with whatever we're feeling, it is tiring. And if you've been sending loving kindness to the loved and to yourself, your mind's probably become quite subtle and quite bright, even though you might not realize that. And so any kind of trace of a hindrance that arises has a bigger impact than it normally would because you see it more clearly in a way. Like you see it more clearly and and you're sensitive to it. So um, 
It could be that you were feeling nauseous and headachey because you're trying a bit too hard, or it could be because there was conflict and hindrances arising. So it's good that you stopped and uh, went back to the loved person. Um, and I guess it's just a matter of waiting for the nervous system to calm down. And you can do that by also going back to loving kindness for yourself. Not really going back, it always sounds like it's a regress. Going to the loving kindness for yourself. And um, I think it sounds very wise that you rested and um, that now you're coming back. So maybe next time try a different person. I mean, it might be that, you know, the conflict there is a bit too intense, even if you do think it might be in your head. Maybe it just feels a bit challenging right now. You don't have to work with a difficult person. And you might have been doing it for a very long time. Who knows? You say you lost track of time. So... Um, Try with the easier people. Maybe go for the neutral person for longer periods. And uh, that's already really quite profound. So, And then if you feel like it, you could just bring up someone that there is some um, distress or uh, disagreement with, perhaps. Just for a really short time. Try not to get lost. Maybe even make a, a kind of um, resolution that I'll send meta to this person for two minutes or for five minutes and then I'll stop. And that way you might not lose track of time. So that's something people do when they even go into really deep meditation, because in there there's no sense of time. So before going in, if they say have to teach, they say, um, before they go in, may I come out at such and such a time? And they program the mindfulness in that way. So you could perhaps try that. Yeah. Hee <laughs> hee. <laughs> I love this little diagram, that is so cute. I have to show people. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but it's just really cute. Anyone see that? <laughs> it's like a little heart with arms. <laughs> and it's got just the cutest face. <laughs> anyway, it makes me happy just to look at it. We should make little things like that. Anyway, <laughs> can you explain the difference between samadhi and jhana? I'm always confused. Yeah, I guess samadhi is loosely used to mean any kind of calm in the mind, but not necessarily at the depth of jhana. However, in the Eightfold Path, when the Buddha refers to Sama Samadhi as the seventh factor, he is defining that as jhanas, the four jhanas. So Sama Samadhi actually is the four jhanas. And that's a whole other discussion as to exactly what a jhana is, which I think is not really within the scope of this retreat or question and answer because there's a lot of uh, difference in the way people uh, understand what a jhana is. You can read books on it and decide for yourself. But go for the deep one. Don't go for something light because you think, then I've got a better chance of getting it. <laughs> I mean, it sounds funny, right? But why do that, actually? <laughs> You know, unless you just want to make yourself feel good or something. I mean, okay. You can encourage yourself in different ways, but you don't have to. I always think, you know, if there was something deeper, the Buddha surely would have experienced it. So if some teachers are saying there's something deeper, then just keep going. You know, just keep going. Why stop? Why stop halfway? The deeper the samadhi, the deeper the wisdom as a result. So yeah, jhanas are... Defined, Sama Samadhi is defined as uh, the four jhanas, but when I use the same Samadhi, I, I mean any kind of um, calm. It's probably more appropriate to use the word Samatha for the method of calming. So what we're doing is samatha ing the mind, we're calming the mind, and Samadhi is more like a noun. Does that make sense? Is that good enough? Yeah? All right. Warm greetings with three hearts on warm orange paper. Mm -hmm. The first evening here I just barely fell asleep and I had a sensation that a male presence tapped my shoulder twice to wake me. <laughs> Could it have been a racket's tree deva? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have any personal deva stories? <laughs> well, I sent Meta to the devas this afternoon and had some PT. That's funny, because just in the last sit, I was also remembering the devas and sort of sending them meta, which I never do, actually. Not really, 
hardly ever. Um, so maybe they're around. I really think they do love the trees, and I always have this sense that they're in the pine trees. But maybe that's just because I love pine and cedar trees very much. But the arms of those trees just look like great places for Davis to sit. <laughs> so there are such things as tree Davis, there's earth Davis, there's sky Davis, there are all kinds of Davis discussed in the Buddhist texts. Um, as monastics, we're not really meant to talk about our own personal stories, but I don't really have any anyway, so that's okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I can sometimes sense there might be something, but I wouldn't sort of claim that I definitely know that, you know. It just, it's a little bit magical, it's a little bit mysterious, but sometimes you feel there's something involved, you know, there's some kind of um, presence or energy that's positive that's helping somehow helping with your day or helping my treasurer go to the bank or, you know, <laughs> something like that. But I don't really look into it too much. But uh, So I don't have personal Deva stories, but there are lots and lots of Deva stories and there are lots of Deva stories from my time in Burma because my teacher spoke about his encounters with the Devas just like as though he was speaking about the kind of bread he bought at the supermarket. <laughs> it was so normal, so natural, and very common for him to um, speak with Davis to the point that sometimes I got a bit grumpy and thought, I think he relates more to them than he does to us. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, he used to um, kind of smell like beautiful incense and then he'd be able to trace the source and sort of see these radiant, beautiful Davis and he'd say that the beauty of the devas was far, far surpassed anything in the human realm. So they were really, really divinely beautiful and glowing and radiant. And um, I guess that really helps, you know, to kind of overcome any kind of interest <laughs> in fellow human beings. But this um, teacher of mine in Myanmar, Sayadaw Upanyajata, he'd been a monk since five years old. So he had perfect sila. And at around 16 or less, I think 16, 17-ish, he um, did get into really deep meditations regularly and would sit there for three days, days, without moving, <laughs> without going to the toilet, without eating, whatever. Uh, so this is why I'm saying there is a depth of jhana that's like the real jhana, which is not uncommon in people who practice so deeply for such a long time and uh, especially in Asian countries. And uh, he would start to get all kinds of psychic powers, and he talked to his teacher, who was actually the Sunlun Sayadaw, uh, was his first teacher, and tell him that, oh, today this and that many people are going to come and bring this and this and this sort of food. And he'd be able to even see when they came how the tables were laid out and things like that. And he could, and it could be verified. Right? It could be verified. And he was only young, so I mean, there was no kind of restriction on this. He wasn't fully ordained. There's no restriction on talking about this. There's no rule against it as a novice. And um, again, it's very commonly accepted as, uh, as a true phenomena in places like Myanmar, where people have barely any out stimulation from the outside world, you know, certainly in the monasteries, if you grow up from a young age. Um, so he kind of became known for that. And in our monastery, he... Um, would talk about the different types of beings that were there. And he uh, went to another place at one time and said there were some really strange beings, like half human, half bird, which I don't know if that's the Garudas. There's some speak about Garudas, which are like these kind of celestial birds in the suttas. Um, but sometimes he used to say to us, actually, because he was moving further north to a new monastery, and he was saying that the place wasn't yet ready because unless we had kind of mindfulness 24 hours, they could still disturb the minds of the yogis. So he wanted to wait until our mindfulness was like 24 hours around the clock before taking us there. And I wasn't about to, I don't think I ever got to that. Although I could still feel lots of things during the so-called sleep. Um, that was a high bar. So, um, but then after a while, after he went there and used to spread metta a lot, uh, he said that now the, de the beings were much more settled and much more ready um, to have people there and they wouldn't be disturbing anymore, so he invited us all there. 
and me and one other non, basically. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I never made it because uh, of my health. But uh, yeah, he used to talk about these things as if it was very normal. But the thing is, it, it's interesting because it shows the kind of power of the mind. That it, it, give, it can give us a sense that there might be realms or experiences beyond our usual um, sense world, right? Um, and I think that's quite humbling and can be perhaps inspiring. But I also think it can be distracting. And if we make much of it and think, wow, that's a sign of something really amazing or somebody who's really enlightened, that would be a mistake. In the case of my teacher, he was, he also did develop very deep wisdom. And I had confidence in him as at least a stream winner. But um, I say confidence because you never know, right? And no one's going to proclaim it if they're the real thing. Um, But otherwise, it can be a distraction. And a lot of Burmese yogis who came to that retreat center would have all kinds of experiences of going up to these different realms and even going down to some lower realms just to have a look. And I remember this one girl who had a sort of natural propensity for this. And uh, and my teacher, Sayadaw, said, uh, well, okay, play around for a bit, but not for too long. Don't get distracted from your meditation, you know. But she didn't really listen, and she just carried on playing in that way. And I don't think you get a lot of benefit, to be honest. And there's also a danger of getting a kind of so-called spiritual ego, but it's nothing spiritual about it. It's just... His ego. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, David's story is a kind of cute. And uh, I'll see if I can think of any more. But maybe that's enough. <laughs> and who knows, it could have been a Deva who tapped you on the back. Could have been our own mind. Maybe it's one and the same. I don't really know. So far, Metta is directed towards a being. Eventually, when we are far along the path, Could there be no being? Yes. No self, no neutral person, no loved one. Will will we be able to just emerge, or, yeah, immerse ourselves, I guess, in one immense boundaryless meta? Gratitude. (laughs) I was starting to think, oh, goodness, there's only one day left. I wonder if we'll actually get to that, and maybe I should have got to that already, where we just spend it in all directions. So, I mean, if you want to have a go, you can. But tomorrow afternoon, certainly, we'll be doing that. Tomorrow morning, maybe a bit more with the disliked. But uh, we can try. And, you know, at first, unless you're in really deep meditation, then it probably is a little bit... um, There's a will involved. There's still some will involved, so it's not, like, really boundless. But it can give you a sense of expansion, a sense of expansiveness, which can be helpful. Um, even then I usually started off with people and then we just spread it to kind of different parts of the world or different directions so there's still sort of people but eventually yes absolutely when the mind simplifies which it can do even without spreading it even by just using one person when the mind simplifies and just uses the feeling of metta for its object then the idea of the person fades away and it's just a feeling that can take you into deeper meditation. So at that point, if you do get into metta jhana, then you'll experience something just like love, just like pure love without a giver or a receiver because at that time the mind is unified. So there is no giver or receiver. There's no object and person who's watching the object anymore. The two merge together. So yes, this is definitely possible that there's no... And, of course, those jhana states are states where there is a very refined sense of self. I mean, it can feel like there's no sense of self, but because, you know, you're not analysing anything, you're just unified. But um, you can still take those things as the higher self. They're still not the same as stream winning. It's still the sense that you are the mind, you are the purified mind, or you are love, or you are boundless consciousness. So, um, but yes, I think that's very true. (laughs) Beautiful thought, isn't it? Oh my goodness, do you have any good Deva stories? Especially... (laughs) Okay, so this is like at least three people been thinking about Davis today. (laughs) (laughs) Especially personal experiences of those who you know 
Okay. <laughs> At least you didn't ask my personal experience. <laughs> Which is fine. I don't mind that you do. I don't mind at all. I just don't actually have really any that are worth, you know, that are really interesting. There's just like a sense of it. Um, personal experiences of those I know. I might tell you uh, the story that Ajahn Brahm has. He didn't actually see a deva, but again, you know, the monks aren't really allowed to say too much about those kind of super normal experiences. But what he did say is that he was a young monk, and after five years in Thailand or anywhere really, that well, especially Buddhist countries, if uh, you're a monk and you've spent five years with your teacher, you're allowed to go on two dong, which means you basically can wander just with your bowl and robe and maybe a mosquito net. Hopefully a toothbrush, not sure. A razor, because they've got to shave their heads. And they just go, like, through the villages. And the whole culture there kind of expects them and has a way to look after them. So if you go to a village and the village person knows that there's a monk, then they'll inform the other people and you'll get the food, you'll get your meal for the day. And then you can go and meditate in the forest and people know that now it's the afternoon, they should leave you in peace. So he was doing this, it was his year of Tudong, and uh, one day he uh, just set off in whichever direction he chose. He didn't know where he was going, there were no Google Maps, <laughs> no even paper maps, I don't think. And uh, he got very, very thirsty, and really thirsty because of the humidity and the, um, all the sweat and the loss of salt. And he thought, gosh, I don't know if I can actually make it to a village. I hope there's one coming up. And then he saw a little village in the distance and thought, goodness, thank goodness for that. And, uh, and he said to himself, OK, I'm not sure about these devas, but if there's a deva, let me have a Pepsi Coke or whatever. <laughs> 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 to prove it. <laughs> so he went into this village and... Uh, he wandered around and nothing was happening for a while and eventually just sat down thinking, that's it, there's no Davers. No one came to offer me anything. And suddenly somebody ran out of a, a shop and they said, uh, Namon crap, I think. Excuse me, any Thai people listening because that might be the wrong uh, word. But something like this, which means um, something like, may I offer? And, uh, and they brought him a Pepsi Coke. <laughs> and he was like, wow, this is great. Okay, but could be coincidence, right? And then another person came out of their shop and they gave him another one. <laughs> and he was like, oh my goodness, this is strange. But he was happy, he drank the lot. And then a third one. <laughs> and by now he's like pretty happy and thinking, gosh, this is really interesting. And then a fourth one. <laughs> and his story goes that nine people, he got nine Pepsi Colas from that little village of only about 20 houses and shops. So it's quite amazing, isn't it? And I'm sure he's not telling a lie. <laughs> he sometimes exaggerates, but he maybe exaggerates about one or something. But um, he said he, there were too many to drink in the end, so he just drank some from each and then shared them around the village. And after that, he was convinced there were days. So there's a story. <laughs> but the best stories were from my teacher in Burma, to be honest, because he would describe this in detail. And uh, it was really nice. You also kind of felt that the place was rich with Davis. It was just very magical, very magical time. <laughs> okay, is it enough to simply meditate and cultivate samadhi through metta? Do I need to study Buddhist texts and cultivate my mind? <laughs> Frankly, I'm tired of using my mind and then lots of tears. Oh, I've always been a thinker, a planner. It's been critical in my mind for my survival and security in life. I'm trying to get away from thinking and turning to feeling and listening to my emotions. I don't think I even care too much about my own karma. I don't want to be a bodhisattva. I just want to bring as much love into this world and do no harm to others. Is this too simplistic? Might I become an unwitting agent of Mara? 
blessings from your simple student and then a gorgeous little doggy and I won't say the name because just in case you don't want me to <laughs> this is so sweet and I think it's really a beautiful question and I actually think that I want to give you complete permission if it makes any difference to just keep practicing metta and have the motivation to bring as much love into this world and do no harm to others this is the most beautiful motivation and this is a wise motivation. This is what's meant by right or wise intention. So it's a pure motivation. It seems to be wise in that it's adjusted or adapted to what you need and only you can know that. And so I think this is very beautiful. And at some point in the practice, when you wish to, you may open up a Buddhist text. And because of your practice of metta, you'll be able to soak it in and it'll speak to you in a way that you don't even need to use your mind, your intellect, your critical, analytical thought. So don't rule that out for later, but for now, don't put any pressure on yourself. I would say this sounds like a wonderful thing to do, and um, turning to feelings and listening to emotions is uh, a very um, wise way to learn. You know that some people went to Ajahn Chah um, in his monastery to ask what kind of book they should read, should they read the suttas, and he didn't really encourage that that much, and I do think there's a, maybe he didn't need to, but I think it's important that we do at some point, because to increase our right view, but um, his advice was very wise, because when we do have chance to meditate, it's good to take the opportunity, and he just said, read the book of your heart. So why don't you read the book of your heart and bring that beautiful love into this world? I mean, wisdom will be required to make sure you don't become a so-called unwitting agent of Mara. The only re real way that that can happen is if the love turns into a kind of lust or um, gets affected by the impurities to the degree that you don't notice it. I mean, it's bound to be there because you can't just suppress those things. So in a way, love can be a mirror for those things in a good, healthy way. Um, sometimes it might be too much sentimentality, too much kind of attachment to outcome, or um, a sense of, you know, like some other people have said, pleading that everybody be well, or, you know, getting upset when, it, when they're not, or when you're not, or when you do harm. But that's just normal, because you've still got the defilement. So... Um, it's a very beautiful uh, method, and yeah, as I mentioned, Bhante Sajato, one of the Aussie teachers, he has metta as his main practice, and he mainly teaches, may I be happy, and that's mainly what he uses for himself. And I would say he has a lot of wisdom, a lot of analytical power to his mind, maybe that's why he does so much metta, because he is just very, very academic and intellectual. Um, and I think often that's what we need to balance the faculties, actually. The Dalai Lama also said that, didn't he? He said, over in the West, we've cultivated our intellect, but what about our heart? And he always says, in a nutshell, my religion is kindness. So if your religion is kindness, that's a wise way to be. And um, I just find that question really beautiful. So, and the little dog's really cute. <laughs> I actually think more people should take Meta as their main vehicle, including me, because it's a, main, it's a kind of 50% of it, but I usually think I should do 100%. <laughs> Don't think you can go wrong, really. Today, towards the end of longer sits, I started to feel very warm and tingly in my chest and arms, particularly in what I can only describe as an intense body high. Sorry, that's okay. Any pain I felt earlier in the sit is in the background and it feels blissful, though a bit intense and maybe uh, disassociative? Probably not. Is this PT, how to work with this state? Just let it be. I don't think it's disassociative because it's in your body. Disassociation to me is when you actually kind of disassociate from your body through some kind of trauma response. It doesn't sound like that to me. It sounds like PT arising, maybe for one of the first times you felt it in this way, and often when it does arise, it can be quite intense because it's still a little bit coarse. 
But that's okay because our minds have to kind of take that in first of all until we're kind of satiated. It's almost like we haven't had a Pepsi Coke for a long time <laughs> and so we need lots of it <laughs> to kind of give us a bit of fizzy stuff and, you know, a bit of a lift and it's a bit intense and after a while you get a bit sick of the Pepsi Coke <laughs> and then you feel more like having a glass of water. So actually this PT will settle on its own once you've had your fill, once you've drunk your fill and um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If it does feel really intense, you could always um, kind of spread your awareness so it's a little bit more diffuse. Like I said, Ajahn Ram himself has said before when it just so happened, he didn't know, I don't think, but I was having very intense PT and he said, endure the bliss. And it was like, whoo, I got the shivers, you know, because it's like, ah, sometimes we can actually be unfamiliar with it and, and want to withdraw from it because we're just not used to handling that and we're a bit suspicious, worried that we're dissociating, something's going wrong, but no, nothing's going wrong. The main thing in meditation is that everything arises is na- that arises is natural and um, it's just nature doing its thing. So the more we can actually get out of the way and allow that to happen, allow the process to unfold, um, the more we learn in a way, right? We just become the observer and uh, the whole process just works itself out. So usually it begins off a little bit more intensely and then it starts to quieten into what is pasadi or or sukha. But it's not always linear in that way either. So just enjoy it while it lasts. It's also impermanent. Um, How is your more... Oh, name. Name pronounced properly. And what is its meaning? My name pronounced properly is Chanda, R, as in long A, Chanda. And it means uh, moon or illumination. But my whole name is actually Chanda Visuddhi because my first teacher gave me Chanda based on the day of the week. In Burma, they um, choose an initial for your name based on the day that you were born. And funnily enough, it's the same as my lay name, which is Lucy, which means light. So I thought that was quite nice. And also because I love nature, so it's quite nice to have the moon, something in nature that you can observe and that illuminates the sky. But then the second part, Visuddhi, I chose myself because it's, um, it means pure, so it kind of goes with Chanda. There's some sutta where it talks about the mind being pure and radiant like the moon. Um, Chandanam, Vipalam, Suddham, Sudha is the pure part. But the Visuddhi is um, my teacher Ajahn Brahm's royal name, which is a bit funny because he's very anti royalist, but <laughs> in Thailand they get sometimes um, a kind of, what would you call it? There is a name for it. It's like a Chao Kun, but it's like prestige if you're a really senior monk kind of thing. And then it's like you get a royal title, and his title is like Visuddhi. So I didn't want to be called Chanda Brown, because that sounds really silly. But, <laughs> but I thought if I could be called Chanda Visuddhi, it's like a piece of inspiration from my teacher. So that's what it means. And most of these names are, that are given are kind of synonyms for Nibbana, or for pure mind at the very least. And uh, they're aspirational names. So uh, I quite like that in Burma you don't choose your own name, because it's more of a renunciation. Um, but, yeah, often in my teacher's monastery and in the nuns' monastery too, in Perth, they let them choose their own name. I think probably over here too they get a bit of choice about it. So, uh, yeah, you can pick a name that you want to work towards the meaning of. Uh, okay. My teacher calls, row, row, row your boat... The Buddhist National Anthem. <laughs> oh, right. I might say float your boat. Anyway. <laughs> uh, one member of her Sangha wrote meta words for the, for the time. May something be well. May something be well. May, may... Oh! For the... Okay, may, may something be well, maybe, may, may be well, I don't know. Happy, healthy, safe and free, may something, there's a blank, you know, as in the name. 
may such such be well. May may my such such be well. May such such be well. Healthy, happy, safe and free. May such such be well. I name all, all beings, etc. Okay, okay. So well, well, happy, safe and free, well. All right. I use the song silently. I think you're doing it in that tune, right? When I walk or hike, especially when it's alone or a long or difficult hike. Sorry about my inability to read properly. Often extending it to any beings I meet along the way. Does that count towards daily meditation goal? <laughs> Depends what your goal is, doesn't it? Um, what is your goal? Yeah. That's quite serious. What is your goal? If your goal is to do that when you hike, then that's wonderful. It's wonderful. But uh, you can you can do more than that as well. You but do what you feel like doing when you feel like doing it. If this brings you happiness, and if it's actually um, bringing the results of loving kindness, more loving kindness into your life not just making you happy, but also affecting the people around you and people start to notice that you're more patient, more forgiving, more kind, then the practice is working and uh, maybe you'll be inspired to do it even more or maybe you'll be inspired to uh, do it at other times as well. So yeah, I don't see why not. If I did that, I'd just have row, row, row your boat around my head. So it wouldn't actually work. <laughs> then I'd have an earworm. But if it works for you, then all well and good. <laughs> it seems like the time's flying, but maybe I'm being really slow. Is everyone okay? Do you mind if it goes on late? Okay. We've got ten minutes. I'll try and speed up a little bit. Hello, was wondering if on our last night you would be willing to sing the, <laughs> the Buddha's loving kindness chant in Pali. If everyone agrees, I thought that would be very beautiful to hear. Also, sorry for being daft, <laughs> but can you please explain the difference between a non and a bhikkhuni? I understand you are both. <laughs> or neither. <laughs> 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 Lastly, okay, maybe I should start there first, stop there first. I thought about doing the loving kindness chant in Pali, but the thing is that if we do it as a group, no one else knows it, and it's a lot to learn in one night, so we might miss the kind of group feeling of chanting together in English. I don't know. Do you want me to do it in Pali? I mean, I could do it at another time, but I do another nice little chant to finish the retreat, but that's a surprise. Because the loving kindness chant in Pali is quite um, well. It's full length, right? It's full length chant, but it's it's very nice. But it's a bit beyond the scope now to teach everybody. I don't know who wants the loving kindness chant in Pali or on the last night instead of the English one. Both. <laughs> Both. Yeah. You chant Pali, and then later we'll do the. Ah. Oh. All oh, right. I mean, some people here probably know the Pali. Yeah, I have a special tune for it. So, um, if you can keep up with the tune, you're welcome to try. The ones that know the party. We can try, if people would like that. Yeah, why not? Okay. Anyone not want that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to be subversive? Okay, you're too harmonious. Good. So, um, okay, I'll start with the nun and the bikini. Nun is a generic word for anyone ordained, I guess. Bhikkhuni is someone who's fully ordained. So that's the main difference. And I think um, there were different sort of thoughts among bhikkhunis at least, and maybe other nuns, about the word non, because over here perhaps it has very Christian or Catholic connotations because people aren't really aware that there are Buddhist nuns. So they actually tried to sort of steer away from it and call themselves monks because um, people usually think of monks as Buddhist or something like that. But I think it's too early when there's a marginalised community that's invis invisible to um, put ourselves together with the dominant group too soon because then they'll just presume that monks are men and then the fact that there are no nuns or not many nuns might not be obvious. So I kind of feel like we need to use a different word. My preferred word is just bikuni, 
But of course, then I do refer to myself as a nun for people who don't understand Pali. So, um, yeah, there are lots of types of nuns, and this is one of the reasons I think it's important to have the option for full bikini ordination because there are so many different types of ordination platforms for women, which means different ways of training, which in the one way you could say gives a choice, but in another way makes it very difficult for us to kind of come together as a community because we don't quite know how to do things together. Like normally for monks, you're either a novice or you're fully ordained, and that's it. So any community that you enter, there'll be a place for you with the novices or with the fully ordained monks. And if you're fully ordained, you go to the same um, ceremonies together, you recite your rules together, you make decisions about how to run the community together. But for nuns, it's very difficult because if someone's not a bikini, they can't join in with that, but they might be on different precepts. Like in England, the nuns there have what's officially a novice ordination because there is no 150 precept ordination, but they've created a 150 precept ordination. So they actually live more like bikunis, but they're not officially bikunis. So when they have their recitation of the rules, I would have to sit on the outside. And if they would come to me, they would have to sit on the outside. So it's very awkward, actually. And then it makes it very complicated in terms of respecting one another appropriately, because some of them are far senior to me, but they're not fully ordained. So I'm not supposed to bow, and I'm supposed to be senior, and in some ways I am, but... It's very awkward. It's quite painful for women, actually. It's quite painful. And I think eventually the way forward is just to have a standard ordination platform that gives us every opportunity to develop the training fully as the Buddha laid down. And the main reason it's important, I think, to take the full ordination, other than the full training, is... um, I mean, the full training is vital because it's actually a very compassionate training and it's quite free relatively from a lot of cultural influences that can creep in. Um, In other words, it goes back to the Buddha. It's not something that unawakened people created. It's created by an awakened one and it's very democratic, believe it or not, and very compassionate. And the other reason that it's important is that uh, only bikunis can ordain other nuns. So by nuns I mean novices and bikunis as well. Uh, novices can't do that. So even if you're on more precepts but you're not officially fully ordained, you don't have any um, agency in developing a community in your way, in a way that suits the circumstances, suits the people who live there. You have to defer to the monks. And you can't really you're not actually seen as a source of merit because the Buddha said that it's the fourfold, it's the it's the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis who are sort of a field of merit for the lay people. So people feel that it's better to give alms to monks than to nuns because there are more precepts. <laughs> so it's very complicated actually and it's, uh, it doesn't need to be. You know, it's just the way it's gone and the discrimination that's followed and the sort of conservative attitudes of some people that make it harder to be in state but it is happening and hopefully we can continue that for the sake of everybody really because I just think we need more and more monasteries it doesn't really matter if not everybody wants to be a bikuni but we need a choice you know it's like why not have a choice otherwise it's like saying well I want to study medicine but I can only study as a junior doctor or I can only study as a doctor's assistant you know, but what if there are some women that want to be a doctor? <laughs> so you're depriving those women of the opportunity to fulfil their potential, but you're also depriving everyone else who could be treated by that doctor from maybe a very good remedy. And there can't be too many, right? I mean, why not have many? So, but it's important to say here as well when we talk about different levels of ordination that it's not like you're superior because you've taken more precepts. It's actually a deeper renunciation, so you should be coming out of any kind of conceit or any kind of sense that these nuns are better than those nuns because it's the renunciation in the heart that really matters. But yes, it does have practical implications as well. Oh, I said I would speed up.
I hope everybody's not bored, but uh, there's some interest for most people, at least, with these questions. Lastly, I'm still a bit confused on the tradition being relied upon here. I understand your expertise is in the early Buddhist text, but does this make it Thai forest tradition? <laughs> um, are these the same teachings as, say, Thich Nhat Hanh? Please forgive my ignorance. Okay. <laughs> so the Thai forest tradition... Um, is part of the Theravada tradition. So there's two main traditions. There's the Theravada and there's the Mahayana. There is Vajrayana too, which is a sort of extension of Mahayana, but I might be wrong about that because I don't really um, know a lot about those two traditions. The Theravada tradition is based on the Pali canon. So we follow the teachings that have been preserved in Pali language, which was the sort of closest language to that that the Buddha spoke. And then the later, the Mahayana tradition is slightly later, and that's the tradition that went to like Tibet, Vietnam, um, Korea, Taiwan, um, what else? China, Japan. sorry? Japan. Japan. Um, and they base their um, learning on the Sanskrit text. Some of them are very much in parallel and some of them are different and some of them have combined with the religions in those places. Um, for example, the Tibetan traditions combined a lot with the Bon religion that was there already. So um, early Buddhist text is just a way of saying Theravada, but it's <laughs> trying to get back to um, really what we base ourselves on. So some people are just starting to use the term early Buddhism instead of Theravada, but it's, yeah... It's kind of the same thing. The thing with Theravada is that because it's become a tradition, it also has a lot of um, like cultural influences. For example, there can be, uh, in the way that the Theravada is practiced in the Thai community, can have a lot of things, rules for the monks, monks mainly, because they don't really have bhikkhunis, many, um, that are actually not in the Vinaya, they're not in the early Buddhist text, but they've but nobody realises that anymore because it's just what you do in Thailand. Yeah? So, because bhikkhunis weren't really accepted in any of those traditions, whether Burmese or Thailand or generally in Theravada, I think we feel it frees us up a bit to be more aligned with the early Buddhist texts and to, um, we don't need to take on Thai cultural tradition, tradition because we were never part of that anyway, right? So in a way that's quite nice, but it also means we don't get the support of the Thai people or you know any cultural group because they don't see that we're their non. Like in for the monks, if you're ordained in the Thai tradition and you go somewhere where there are a lot of Thais, they'll be like, you're a Thai monk, you're, you're our monk, and they kind of take you in. But no one takes us in because we don't have that like lineage in the same way. So that's one of the difficulties there, yeah. Anyway, I hope that explains it a bit. But, you know, I mean, ultimately, I don't think any of these traditions are that different. I mean, we all practice sila, virtue. We all practice um, some stilling of the mind using different methods. Some use different deities. Some use mantras. We don't really use those so much in Theravada, but different individuals may. And many people, I think there are people here, combine some of these practices from the different traditions and find their own practice that works for them. So samatha is there, calming the mind, and also wisdom has to be there. Yeah. Okay. Hello. I've been having strange dreams during the past couple of nights. Random things like people and places I haven't thought about in years. I do feel my mind becoming more settled and bouncing around less when I'm sitting but then it seems to be bouncing around more. I love these bouncy minds. <laughs> When I'm asleep, it's a nice way of saying, um, yeah, I'd probably say restless or just, you know, I'd say a negative word, bouncing is really sweet. I don't mean because it's negative, I just mean because I'd be negative to me. Around more when I'm asleep, is this common, will it stop? <laughs> Everything stops. That's that you can be sure. <laughs> it will, it will. But not when you want it to, that's the only problem. Uh, it's very common. I mean, that happens to me pretty much always in retreat, you know. Um, it's as though 
your mind just wants to play a little bit because you've been kind of quiet all day. It's like it's been really sort of good for you in the day and then at night it sort of wants to play. But I think really what's happening is you're kind of going to deeper levels of your subconscious mind and so the stuff that you um, are not aware of that's been buried and someone mentioned burying stuff kind of almost intentionally. A lot of us do that all the time actually through distractions or through things like social media. There's a bit of a hollowness and you don't want to feel it and so you just scroll you try and fill it that way, you know, or with food or with anything, really. I mean, people go and jump off buildings with a little parachute and they've barely got any chance of opening it in time because they need some <laughs> adrenaline, you know, they need that rush, seriously. <laughs> so we do that. And then here we're like trying to, um, you know, we're kind of allowing the mind to go deeper and the mindfulness is arising so we start to be aware of all that stuff in the deeper levels of the mind and it kind of comes out when we're not trying to control it which is during the night in our dreams so it doesn't really mean anything I kind of think it of it almost like the mind's emptying itself out so that's how come it will stop but I don't know when I mean it could be lifetimes you know so but it tends to go through phases I think on retreat I'm just thinking if when my mind went silent in Myanmar for like long periods that um, there was less dreaming, probably. But what would happen is that I'd be aware of the arising and passing all night and then it was like I was spinning. After a while I got really exhausted. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the mind, it's still busy, even in the night. <clears throat> When the body and mind are well rested, PT and deep stillness seem to arise more often during lying down meditation rather than sitting. How to skillfully practice with this? Continue meditating in all positions? Question mark. I love how you all know your own answers. It's so good. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, it's important to have the body and mind well rested, and it's interesting that you notice the correlation there with the stillness and the PT because you're more resourced. Um, and the mind's just relaxed, you know, when your body is rested too. So it's interesting that this is quite common among meditators that when we're less active, like lying down or about to sleep, that we actually go deeper, and this is because of the letting go. But it's almost like we have to have a bit of effort in the beginning to get our minds on a wholesome track. And when you have, you can increasingly let go. So that's great. But if you just let go only from now on and only lie down, then you might lose some of the momentum, which is why it's probably good to keep alternating your postures. But I, I mean, I have known people that meditate a lot lying down. In fact, there was one so-called Vipassana. I say so-called because, you know, it's not an identity. Someone who did a lot of Vipassana, let's say, meditation, um, he ended up just lying down all the time in his meditation. He was meditating like 12 hours a day and because he was also sleeping a lot and he developed his mindfulness already, he wouldn't sleep when he was lying down, but he would just find it a really easy posture. Um, but it's rare that people would do that. And he thought it was working well. There's another person I know who um, often gets into deep meditation after sleeping. <laughs> because the mind's rested and it's not controlling as much. And it just feels kind of happy. So, yeah. Continue meditating in all positions. Also, it seems as the metta is a uh, kind, something simply the word kindness is kind. Simply the word kindness often feels most helpful as an object. Is this okay? Yeah, that's fine. It's a kind of meta-type word. Sometimes people just say meta, meta, something like that. Again, after the momentum's been built. Because if you go too quickly onto reducing words or kind of, uh, or do that all the time, it'll probably start to lose its effect. But you can try. It's like switching gears a little bit. So you can try and see if the car still goes. Oh my goodness. I don't know if there were a lot of questions or I'm just talking a lot. Meta is definitely a wet blanket for me too. 
if that blanket constantly whispered at me about my faults. Oh. I was pondering this over a cup of tea, curled up on the couch like a cat. Suddenly this thought came. Man, it would be way easier to love myself if I were a cat. Oh, a flood of love came in out of nowhere. Isn't that lovely? So just pretend to be a cat, but it won't work this time, because you'll be expecting it. <laughs> Do you have any favourite shifts in perspective that have helped you in your practice? Bonus points if they're a bit silly or whimsical. Oh, oh no, now the pressure's on to think of one. Also, a cloud and a mountain walk into a bar. <laughs> I'll come up with the rest tomorrow. <laughs> I hope you already know the next bit, because otherwise you'll be thinking about it a lot. <laughs> Do you have any favourite shifts in perspective that have helped you in practice? Bonus points if they're a bit silly or whimsical. It's actually not a silly one or a whimsical one, but it's kind of more like a, a tender one. That one time I was um, feeling just really sad. And I think I was a bit peeved that day as well. Is that an American word, to be peeved? Yeah. It's not a rude word, I think. <laughs> um, because there was a lot of banging happening on the roof and uh, I was trying to get into my meditation during the rains and I just got ready for my personal retreat and choom, the roof kept kind of banging really loud as the sun expanded the metal and I thought, oh no, is this going to happen for the whole time? Like you always project, isn't it? And uh, Anyway, all this sadness came up that evening and then I just kind of remembered this Poor me that had been abused by this person. And uh, I did my walking meditation, imagining kind of that I was walking. It sounds a bit weird. And I was holding my head, or maybe Ajahn Brahm was, I forget. And the other one of us was holding my feet, and we were just like holding me. And I was walking with this perception, and the tears started coming. And it was really sweet somehow. It was just one of those like creative things that the mind conjures up to process some emotion that I didn't even know it was about that, but it was just a feeling like I'm really held, you know. And then the interesting thing the next day was that I was meditating and I had a much softer mind. And it wasn't just that the banging in the roof didn't bother me. I actually didn't notice it. <laughs> and anyway, I'm spoiling tomorrow's talk now, but this showed me that metta not only softens our reactions, but it actually influences, our state of mind influences what we actually notice. You know, we literally don't take in some things when we've got, I don't know, a certain mind. A metta mind, we take in less of the so-called irritations. An aversive mind, we take in less of the beauty. So that was a shift in perspective, I guess. So, yeah. hope that'll do. You can ask me again if you want more. What's the difference between Buddha's early teachings and the later ones? <laughs> Were they from different Buddhas? Who is the best Buddha? <laughs> <laughs> the one in you. <laughs> you are the best potential Buddha that ever was. Yeah, I think I've talked about uh, the difference, maybe, and I, I honestly don't know much of the difference between the Buddha's early teachings. So you're asking about the different teachings, which I think I've said a bit about, and I don't really know a lot more about. Um, were, they dif were they different Buddhas? No, they weren't different Buddhas. The different teachings that are around today all came from Gautama the Buddha, but they've kind of diverged and taken on other influences and... You know, it's always a living tradition somehow, and that's one of the beauties of the Buddha's teaching, that it can be applied to all kinds of cultures and times, and, you know, as long as the actual essence remains. The real essence is the Noble Eightfold Path, honestly. Like, you have to have every one of those factors in alignment with what the Buddha taught, and then you know you're on the right path, even if you don't call yourself a Buddhist. Um, the different Buddhas go back eons and so it's really difficult to say but one thing that I learned um, recently is that one of the Buddhas dispensations didn't last that long and I forget why it was but it didn't last that long and I'm not sure if it was 
He didn't teach it all. Or I think it might have actually been that he didn't establish the fourfold assembly strong enough or something like that. And the fourfold assembly includes bikunis, right? And all lay men, lay women and everything else. All people. Um, but I might be wrong, but I, I think that's why. Anyway, so there is a difference in the Buddhas in that sense, that some just seem to have more power to keep the Dhamma going for longer. And we're really lucky because we have the Dhamma perfect and pure, really. I mean, we're so immensely lucky because there are eons when it's not there and you have to actually figure it out for yourself. Yeah. Wow. Ah, just a short letter. <laughs> Is everyone okay? Would anyone like to go to bed? It's quarter to nine now, but it's only quarter to eight, really. <laughs> <laughs> But I think for me, I'll probably try and wind up in 15 minutes because I would also like to go to bed. There's five more questions. So, uh, But I kind of really respect everybody's question. I don't want to miss anyone out. But if anyone feels like it's just too much and it's, you know, stirring you up or you're just tired, then please feel free to just quietly leave. I won't take offence at all. Now, I've heard another joke. <laughs> I don't know the end to. Oh no, the Buddha went to a hot dog stand. I'm left wondering what kind of hot dog it was. <laughs> Veggie, chicken or beef? Did the Buddha really eat hot dogs? <laughs> what did he eat aside from spoonfuls of rice? You said it was good to be funny in answer to my last question. What if I'm not trying to be funny? At least I don't need to be concerned about being smart, as you can tell from my questions. <laughs> I wonder if you're writing questions like this to the staff as well. <laughs> You'd be keeping them, <laughs> keeping them entertained. You did provide wonderful advice to deviate from the phrases. Okay. Uh-oh, if not may I be a hot dog. <laughs> I hope not. My new phrase is, may my mind settle down at least a little bit sometimes. Oh. Sprinkle in a bit of meta. <laughs> I sprinkle in a bit of meta. I guess I don't know the end of these two jokes. I'll go home. Oh, I'll go home and try in my, and try in my glass of milk. <laughs> Okay. It means you're not going to the bar, I suppose. But that's very sweet. <laughs> and thank you for your lightheartedness. And just um, being serious, it's okay to deviate, yes. May my mind settle down at least a little bit. Just be sure you're not kind of telling your mind off. Because actually, if you ask your mind to be, you know, if you tell your mind, like, may I love my mind or something, then it might feel like, mm, I'm so loved I can just go to bed now, you know? Like you tell a little child that they're loved. You don't really tell them when they go to bed, may you settle down at least a little bit. I mean, you may. <laughs> but you're more likely to get that result if you say, oh, you know, you're so loved, and, you know, just enjoy a nice sleep, be peaceful, may you be calm. Uh, yeah. So it's okay. But just be sure you're not telling yourself off using soft speech. Will you please speak more about the vision you have for the new monastery? Thank you for sharing the joyous news yesterday. Please can I keep this for tomorrow? Because tomorrow I actually have a whole half hour to use for this and I promise I won't bore you for half an hour. But it will just be an opportunity to talk a bit and uh, yeah, have some questions and things like that. An extra one. Because my vision is not really my vision as much as, I mean, there might be specifics, but it's really the Buddha's vision. And uh, the monastery is a creation in progress. So uh, it'll be interesting to hear from you as well. <laughs> what does Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz have in common with a Buddhist meditator? They both just want to go on... Um, 
but I'm sure it's a Hindu meditator. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I'm not even Adrian Brown when I'm getting these jokes. <laughs> That's my comma. <laughs> when sending meta to myself, I keep getting caught on may I be free. I'm not sure if I'm really wanting true enlightenment just yet. Do I have to be committed to the whole thing right now? <laughs> or can I just commit to becoming more peaceful and still? I kind of like my attachments. <laughs> well, then there's no whys, are there? Because you won't get enlightened if you like your attachments. <laughs> about that. The thing is, it's really interesting because people like me can think I want true enlightenment, but honestly, when you get a bit deep, it can be scary, you know. So we think we want these things, but we really don't know what we want. We don't know what it is that we're wanting because, you know, we might think we're going to get something really wonderful, but we actually kind of want it without having to let go of everything. And this is why most people might think they are, but they're not, because actually they don't want to let go of everything. So then they say, well, you know, in enlightenment, you can still be there, you can still enjoy it, you can still have your consciousness there and all this stuff. But that's not the case. So, but the beautiful, compassionate thing about enlightenment is, is that you only get happier the more you give up. And it's the happiness that sucks you in. So actually, it's a good goal to just... Um, uh, trying to choose my language to just uh, be content with the peace and the stillness because um, be content with the peace and the stillness no matter how much is there because that is actually the way to that enlightenment in the first place and eventually you'll be so peaceful and still that you just won't even be interested in some of those other attachments and it won't be like you had to give them up they just won't interest you anymore it's like a child just who isn't really interested in their toys. They haven't said, I mustn't play with my doll anymore, you know, or like, I must move on from this Lego. It's an attachment. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to do that because now they've got like a book to read or they've got a friend to play with or whatever. So it's really, it only gets better. It's a progressive refinement of wholesome joy. So, um, yeah, peace and stillness is a wise... Um, Thing. You see how it's so easy to say focus or aim or this or that. It's a wise thing to be content with and to notice in your mind and um, just enjoy what's there, however much is there and the path will unfold in its own time. So it's good that you're being honest. It's really good. Do I have to be committed to the whole thing? <laughs> it's kind of cute, isn't it? It's kind of funny because it's true like, and it's, it's honest. So just go at your pace and uh, don't push anything because then it's people who push too far. Somebody said to me the other day, like in the question, it was to all of us really, about what's the sort of hindrance of a beginner or of an advanced person, what's the mistake they make. And that's one of the things, like pushing too fast. That's why I said patience is the best thing to have because it's the pushing too fast. It's that kind of planting the seed and seeing the thing sprout. And then you go, okay, it's only this long, I want it to be six inches, it's only two inches, yank it, and then it breaks. So don't do that with your mind. And the thing about metta is that you won't do that with metta, because metta makes the mind really soft, and it's a very gentle and kind of mm, safe way into samadhi, and that you've got something, and this sounds a bit weird, my teacher told me off for saying this once, but I think I know what I mean. It's like you've got something to let go into. He only said don't say that because it sounds like this letting go into this thing, it's like some kind of eternal essence. But I don't mean it that way. I just mean that there's a beautiful state to supplant the more coarse one. And I think it is that gradual letting go. He also says that you get kind of enticed in a way by the happiness and the happiness blindfolds Mara. It's like Mara just disappears for a bit because... Yeah, the happiness just becomes too strong. So it's a way around. <laughs> Does that make sense? Or am I just entertaining myself here? <laughs> <laughs> Almost every night except one. One. 
Makes it one. Something closing my eyes to go to sleep. Oh, every night except one, I'm closing my eyes to go to sleep. I'm getting a light show. Sometimes like a supercharged aura, Borealis. <laughs> Other times a starlit sky. Last night, a sun setting in the left field of vision. They are getting stronger each night that I can now keep my, uh, open my eyes and they're still there when closing them again, at least until they are not. <laughs> Is this Nimitta? I'm not meditating just before or during. Just curious, thanks. Yeah, probably some kind of limiters arising. And um, it's interesting, I said earlier today, that sometimes we go deeper in our meditation when we actually stop trying and when we're actually in more of a restful state. So it's not that you're not meditating then, it's more that you've been meditating all of the day and the momentum of that is still with you, but maybe that little bit of extra relaxation is the letting go that's needed to just enjoy a slightly, it's awful to try and avoid these words, it's hard to say, but it is a slightly deeper stage. It could become a slightly deeper stage, certainly, if these things start to centre themselves in the mind and, and grow strong. Um, so this is lovely and um, enjoyable and all the rest. Um, if you're seeing things like... Uh, or a borealis, that's, yeah, it's normal to see different colours and things may be moving or things that are powerful. That's definitely a sign of a nimitta. Starlit skies are kind of diverse, so that's quite common too. But probably at this stage they're not like really the kind of nimitta that's going to take you into deep meditation because it's a little bit uh, diverse. But they're definitely uh, potential workable nimittas. Uh, the sunset setting sounds simpler a little bit and you're opening your eyes and checking whether they're still there so this is a bit of restlessness <laughs> obviously you want to know because it's interesting right it's an interesting experience but um, of course if you do do that and if you do that many times it will disappear so you know these things are kind of shy and they come up when they think you're not watching or they think you're not going to control them or kind of disturb them and if you do start doing that, then they'll vanish. So if you ever get one of these that's very bright and very strong and quite compelling, either carry on where you're lying down and just relax, don't do anything, or sit up with it and meditate. And also don't do anything, just relax. <laughs> but don't open your eyes. <laughs> And who knows, it might develop, it might become stronger and then it might become blissful and uh, very beautiful and you'll see what happens. So, very good. And if you're not getting these things, it's also very good. It's not by itself a sign of anything other than a state of mind that this person's in at that time. So, good. So I think that's everything for this evening. And, uh, yeah. Thank you for your practice and kindness and warmth. And uh, yeah, let's just sit quietly for a couple of minutes and then we can have our lovely sleep or meditate.